We just finishing up a series uh, that we entitled Supernatural, and uh, it was really talking about the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and just again, are we willing to say yes to the Holy Spirit of God as he, as he moves us, as he leads us, as he guides us, as he convicts us, as he directs us in our lives, are we willing to say yes to him? And one of the questions that we last week asked was, will we, Harvest Time, say yes to the Holy Spirit? We believe that God wants to use us to make a difference in, in our city, in our, in our community, in our state, in our nation, and in, in, in around the world. And are we willing to say yes to him? I love what Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7, as, he's, as the Lord is is challenging Jeremiah, and as Jeremiah is challenging the people of God, he, he says this, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. That word welfare is actually the word shalom, or peace. And, and he's saying, seek the peace of the city. Pray on its behalf to the Lord, and in its peace, you will have peace. And and what an amazing challenge for us as as followers of God, that that you and I as lights in this world would go out into this world by direction of the Holy Spirit, saying yes to the Holy Spirit, into our city, into our community, and we would seek the peace of our community, that we would be really instruments of peace into our community. And that as a result, we would not just seek the peace, but we would pray on behalf of our community. And we'd pray on behalf of our state, on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our world, realizing that in its welfare, in its peace, we find our peace. And are we willing to say yes? Are we willing to go out and, and whatever that looks like, seeking the peace of our city? That, that, could, that, that can take on so many different things. But are we willing to say yes? Are we willing to let God, who wants to do, as Ephesians 3 says, immeasurably more, far more abundantly than all we ask or think? But here's the key. According to the power of at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. According to the power at work within us, question that that I'm asking myself and a question I hope you'll ask yourself is, is that power, is the Holy Spirit at work in me? Is the Holy Spirit at work in me? Ask yourself that question. Because if not, you're not going to seek the peace of the city. You're not going to pray on behalf of the city. You're not going to be an instrument of peace to the city. If the Spirit of God is not at work in you, why would you do that? You wouldn't do that. Because either you're going to do everything according to your flesh, or you're going to walk according to the Spirit. It's that simple. And every single day, we we choose one path or the other. And it's not, you can't have one foot on one path and one foot on the other. It's one or the other. So what are we going to choose? What are we going to say yes to? What what are we going to be willing to let the Spirit of God do in our lives? Because here's the deal. John 6, 63, Jesus says this. It is the Spirit who gives life. You, You want to experience life? You want to experience the life that God has for you? It's the spirit that gives life. Listen to this next part. The flesh is no help at all. (laughs) Truth right there. The, the, The flesh is no help at all. I don't know about you, but I'm my biggest enemy. And I talk to myself the most out of anybody else. And I talk myself out of stuff all the time. And a lot of times that's saying no to the Holy Spirit of God because I just don't know what's coming or I just don't whatever. Am I willing to say yes? The Spirit gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. It comes back to a question that we asked almost a year ago. How's your soul? How's your soul? 
If I was sitting down at a table with you and we're drinking coffee, and I were to ask you that question as a friend asked me that question this past week again, and I'm so thankful for that. How's your soul? How would you answer? What if Jesus was the one sitting down with you at a table having coffee and he were to look at you and say, how's your soul? What would you say? See, the truth is, is that your life says a lot about your soul. If you don't believe me, just look at what the Bible says, Matthew 12, verse 34. Out of the abundance of your soul, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. What are the words coming out of your mouth? What do you find yourself talking about the most? What words are you using? Guess what? Those are a measurement of the condition of your soul. And you all, like me, feeling like somebody stepping on my toes? Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, above everything you do. Notice what it says. Guard your heart. Guard your soul. Why? Everything you do flow fr- flows from it. Why, is, why, why does it matter the condition of your soul. Why, why, does it, why, why even ask this question? Why even evaluate this in your life? How is your soul? Because everything you do comes from it. Everything. Good, bad, ugly, everything in between comes from the condition of your soul. And the beauty is, is that if you know Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Do you not know your body? is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So what? So glorify God in your body. Bring glory to Jesus through your life. And the way that you do that is through whatever's going on in your soul. So asking this question, how's your soul, is, is vital to our lives because the reality is, is what comes out of our mouth and what comes out of our life and the, what we do is all about our soul. And, and we need to understand that out of our being comes our doing. And I realize that some of you will not like the grammar, but I'm doing this on purpose. Who I be... Who I be will direct what I do. You're a human being, not a human doing. You understand what I'm saying? Out of your who you be, who be be you? I guess that's the question. You're like, oh man, that's terrible grammar. I know. But here's the thing, like I think about sports guys, or sports people, uh, actors, actresses, whatever. It's always interesting when they're asked questions on a stage, whatever stage that might be that they're on, and they're asked questions about whatever. It's always interesting to me that in that moment, you can see a lot about their soul. Because I, I think about athletes, I think about different ones that they're asked about, hey, what's it like being at the top of your game? Hey, what's it like just winning the Super Bowl? Hey, what's it like just this? And, and what's interesting is some of them, they'll stop and say, first, I just want to give praise to my Savior, Jesus. First, I just want to glorify God. And that... that tells me volumes about what's going on in their soul. Why? Because in that moment, they could, be, they could put themselves, they're already up on a pedestal. They could easily be like, yeah, it's just the most incredible thing to be the best in the whole world. <laughs> you know, they, I mean, however, they wouldn't say it like that, but that'd be kind of weird. But, I mean, seriously, we see... Out of their mouth, we hear out of their mouth, we see out of their life. I, I think about, again, I, I, don't, I don't like putting names up just because as soon as I do, something happens. But, but so far with this guy, it's been pretty consistent, Tim Tebow. 
And you can say whatever you want about whether or not he was a good NFL quarterback or whatever. Obviously, he didn't make it in the NFL, and there's probably lots of reasons for that. But he was a Heisman winner, and he won two national championships. So he can't be all that bad. But every time I hear this guy talk, and every time I've seen him talk, he talks about his relationship with Jesus over and over and over again. And so what does that tell me? That tells me something's going on in his soul that's overflowing out of his mouth. And, and it's, in my opinion, it's a relationship with Jesus. Not, not a religion that he's following. It's a relationship with Jesus. And who he be is not a football player or a sports a caster. He is a follower of Jesus who happens to be using sports as the avenue to which he's going to tell people about Jesus. See, his being is dictating his doing. Are you, are you catching what I'm talking about? So how's your soul? How, how's your soul? It has everything to do with how you live your life. Everything. So it's no wonder to me that Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the soul. He's talking about Jesus' soul. The mindset, another word for mindset is attitude. What is attitude? Attitude is a settled way of thinking that is reflected in your behavior. A settled way of thinking that is reflected in your behavior. In other words, a settled way of of what your soul holds to is lived out, reflected in your behavior. And we, we have a really upside down topsy-turvy world that says, let's change your behavior, and that's what matters. The the problem is, is that behavior change, well, not bad, is limited. And if you don't change the soul, likely the behavior is never going to completely be changed. How many of y'all are parents? You have, you have children, or you've been around children. You ever been around a kid? What do we do? We try to get them to change their behavior. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But, but let's just be honest. They can one moment be like behaving well, and then 30 seconds later, not so much. Anybody, anybody else have that? issue, maybe even, even personally in your own life as an, as an adult. <laughs> oh, yeah, amen. So it's not about behavior change. God is not about behavior change. Does he want to see people's behavior in a way that honor? Yes. But he realizes that the only way that's going to happen is from a soul that has been transformed. So what is the mindset of Jesus that we're to have in relationship to one another? Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. What's interesting is, is that If you were to read Matthew and just look at it as a timeline, you might say that the Sermon on the Mount was at the early part of Jesus' ministry. The truth is, the Sermon on the Mount is actually more near the middle of Jesus' ministry. And really is, is, honestly, if we were to look at this and look at it as a model for our lives and how we should minister to other people and how we should try to, to help other people come to know Jesus, one of the beauties of Jesus is that he spends the first part of his ministry, the first half of his ministry, building relationships with other people and building relational equity with other people so that he had earned the right to be heard. Because no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And Jesus is the master of that. 
And so he does that, and really in the Sermon on the Mount, this is the beginning of his teaching part of his ministry. He has disciples who have been following him. Y'all know many of the stories of how he called different disciples. What maybe you don't realize is that the Sermon on the Mount, as far as timeline goes, is actually right after he has prayed all night long. In Mark chapter 3, you can read about it, but in Mark chapter 3, he prays all night long, and then out of all of his disciples, and there are hundreds, he calls 12 to be his apostles. Now, they, this, the word disciple means student of, an apostle means sent one. So out of all those that have been following him, that he has been living out this life of a relationship with his father, out of them, he calls 12 to be apostles, sent ones. And what's interesting is, is that as we read, verse 1, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountainside, and when he sat down, his disciples all came to him. Who, who is in that crowd? All, a whole bunch of people but specifically the 12, and they're 12 apostles, 12 that he has appointed to be sent ones, and he's about to teach them what does it mean to go out and seek the, seek the welfare of the city, seek the welfare of the people around you, seek the welfare of, of those that you're going to be ministering to, and what he does is in the Sermon on the Mount, he turns the tables upside down. He upside downs the cart and says what the world is doing and what the Pharisees are telling you is not it. I'm going to give you a whole new set of ways to think about the world, ways to think about the kingdom, ways to think about and realize that I'm about not the kingdom of this world, but the kingdom of heaven. And so it's no dink that he starts off with soul language. The Beatitudes, as we call them. Notice, notice uh, I don't know where the slide is, but can we get that, the sermon slide up there? Um, notice that, the Beatitudes. That's, that's on purpose, just by the way. Why, why? Because you're, who you be determines what you do. And he's doing the same thing with the apostles, with his disciples, addressing who they be. So that as they go out and do, these things are going to be central and core to who they are. Because that makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. The condition of your soul, the definition of your soul, who you are, in the mind of Christ, makes all the difference in how you live. And so he starts off and he says, notice it says, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you and falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Real quick, three, three indicators that Jesus is speaking directly to their soul and about their soul. Num number one is, in verse two, he opened his mouth. You're like, uh, duh. I mean, he's going to teach them. He doesn't want to do, you know, the peanuts teacher, Right? That would be weird. He opens his mouth. 
The problem is, is that in our English language, we lose a lot of the depth and meaning of what's going on here. This phrase, opening his mouth, is actually the idea, and as a rabbi, this phrase is important because what it's meaning is, is that he is going to share and bear his soul to them. He is not just opening his mouth and talking. He is opening up his soul and pouring it out into those that are listening. This isn't just a a common everyday chat. This is Jesus pouring out his soul with his words into his disciples. And so why do I think that he's talking about the soul? Because that's what this phrase is talking about is he's opening up his mouth and he's pouring out his soul in connection to their soul in the hope that they would come to understand that who they be is going to make a difference in what they do. That's indicator number one. Indicator number two is the word blessed or blessed that you see over and over and over throughout these verses. What what does that word mean? What does that word look like? Well, in one way, it means happy. Happy. Blissful. What it doesn't mean, though, is that it's something that you can just fake. Everybody can fake being happy. I mean, let's just be real. How many times you see somebody, and they got a smile on their face, and you ask them how they're doing, and what's the word that comes out of their mouth? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm great. I'm fine. Fine, fine, fine. When in fact, you're not fine. In fact, you're hurting. Or in fact, you're dreading something. Or in fact, you're full of fear. Or whatever. We, we can fake being happy. That's not what this is talking about. This is not something you can fake. This is not something that you can produce. And, and, and honestly, every single one of these, you naturally will not do any of them. In your flesh, in and of yourself, you will not do and cannot do any of these. Because they're not, they're, they're not, it's not possible in your flesh. What is it possible in? The Spirit of God. What is it possible in? The supernatural. These are not natural things. These are supernatural attitudes, supernatural soul responses that come from a relationship with God through his Holy Spirit and out of the overflow of our soul. And what this blessedness is, this blessed is, it is a joy that is a confidence in God that no matter what happens in my life, God is in control. And I can take comfort, and I can have peace, and I can have joy, because I know God's got this. And no matter what comes my way, no matter what is going to happen in my life, I am resting in my relationship with Jesus. That's what that means. You're like, whoa, how how did you get all of that? Well, I can tell you what, it's not from English. The English language, as good as it may be or whatever, it does not do Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic justice. Which, by the way, those are the languages that the Bible was written in. Not English, by the way. English was a translation way later. So, so the Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, and what's interesting is, is you can find out where those are at. You don't have to have a degree in theology, even though that's a good thing, and I'm not downplaying that because I know we have people on our staff that have degrees in theology, and God bless you both. Um, but uh, anyway, it's not, it, you don't have to have a degree to figure this out. There's some resources that are available, and I want to just give them to you, three things. Number one, Got Questions. Amazing website, gotquestions.org. You need to go check it out. And by the way, all three of these, you can download an app on your smartphone. I would strongly, strongly encourage you to do that with all three of these. 
Got Questions is incredible. Why is it incredible? Because you guys have been asking me a lot of questions, and, and I'll be honest with you, um, I cheat. Um, and what do, we, what, do you, what do you mean by that? I go to Got Questions, and I type in your question. I hit return, and it gives me an amazing answer to your question. And I send it to you, and let's be honest, most of the time I tell you, right? Uh, this is from Got Questions, it's not mine, I wish it was. I'm not that smart. Um, but there is, that thing is loaded. And what's awesome about it is, is, is every answer is loaded with Scripture, just loaded with Scripture. The next thing is called Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible, uh, and you can, again, you can get the, the app for it uh, on your smartphone if you have it, or on a, uh, you can put it on a tablet as well. Blue Letter Bible, what's awesome about Blue Letter Bible is, is that you can type in a word or a phrase or a verse, and it will bring back to you all of the Greek or the Hebrew or whatever, and all you've got to do is be able to read English to be able to figure it out. It's really an awesome tool, and so I would encourage you to, to check it out. The third is Enduring Word. What is that? It's a commentary by a guy named um, David Guziak, and uh, it's excellent. I think it's very, very well balanced uh, theologically, and, and it's just, again, are you going to agree with him on everything? No, but he does an amazing job of taking Scripture and bringing it to life, and so, again, another incredible resource, and I definitely encourage you to get it, and like I said, all three of these are apps that you can get on your phone and use anytime, anywhere. So, indicator number two is that word blessed. Blessed. Indicator number three is found in verse three and verse 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and here it is, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 10, he repeats it. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why is this an indicator? Because for the people sitting there listening to Jesus and what he's going to teach through these Beatitudes, but also through the entire Sermon on the Mount, is absolutely contrary to what they were raised to believe. They believed that a Messiah was going to come as a conquering king. And that what he, as the Messiah, was going to do, like Moses, he was going to get them out of bondage from the Roman government. And what they believed was that the Messiah would be a political leader. They believed that he would be a, a, a person who would bring much wealth, material wealth. And Jesus is saying, that is not me. I'm not that guy. I've got a better way, and my way is about transforming your soul, not transforming your circumstances. Because let's just be honest, our circumstances change all the time. But our soul, the moment God transforms it, constant. Yes, is it growing? It should be. It should be growing as a result of, of our relationship with the Lord. But the beauty is, is that it's a constant, even in the mess of all of our circumstances. And nowhere does God promise you that he's going to save you from all of your circumstances. Actually, the Bible makes it clear that if you follow God, you're going to have hardship. You're going to have difficulty. And so it's not about changing of circumstances, it's about changing my soul, it's about changing the destination of my soul that I come to understand that, you know what, no matter what happens in my life, my soul is destined for eternity with God because of a relationship with Jesus, because he transforms my soul. And so as, as we dive into the Beatitudes, my hope is, my desire is, my prayer for you is, is that you would come to understand who or what is it that you're living for. And this last question is, is very important. Whose kingdom are you living for? Like, what, what kind of a Jesus do you want in your life? Do you want a Jesus that's going to bless you materialistically? Are you wanting a Jesus who's going to take over the political realm and just destroy everybody and 
Wipe out the swamp. Is that what you want? Because guess what? That's not Jesus. Jesus isn't here about doing those things. What Jesus wants is to transform your life. And there is a kingdom of earth and there is a kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is all about the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because it's eternal. Why? Because it's the thing that impacts our world today. And listen, Jesus understood this. We can understand this. The only hope for our lives today, the only hope for our nation today, the only hope for our world today is not politics, is not materialism, it is Jesus. Can I get an amen up in here, please? That, that is the only hope for us. It's not whether or not somebody who's sitting on the throne of the White House. That is not the answer. It is not whether or not we get lots of money in our pockets and are able to pay all our bills. That's not the answer. That is not the hope that we can have. The hope that we can have is that Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord and my King, and He will transform my world, my life, for eternity. And we can rest in that. So you've got to come to a place of asking yourself, number one, how's my soul? But then number two, what kingdom are you living for? What kingdom are you living for? And it will put a massive change of perspective on everything that you have. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because here's the reality. Your life's a vapor. Your life is a vapor. Your life is a drop in a bucket. You are here today, and you are gone tomorrow. And you can sit here and think, oh, I've got it all figured out. I've got my five-year plan, my 10-year plan, my whatever plan. Guess what? All of that is not going to matter. I'm not saying don't make that. Please don't get me wrong. It's not like the Bible is like anti-administrative or anything like that. Like, oh, the Bible is so against. No, that, that is not. I'm not saying that. But if that's the world that you're seeking, what I know is the Bible makes it clear one of those kingdoms leads to life. And the other one leads to death. How's your soul? Whose kingdom are you living for? I'm going to ask you would just close your eyes, bow your head. Can I just can I challenge one more thing? And this is a challenge to me also because I'm a parent. The greatest thing you can do for your kids is help them answer that first question. How's your soul? Greatest thing you can do for your kids. Second is to help them come to understand which kingdom are they living for. And please don't walk out of here and be like, PJ's anti-sports and anti-this. and I'm not. I love sports. I love arts. I love all that stuff. And if you got your kids involved in that, that's awesome. But can I challenge you? Help them see that as a means to an end. And the end is Jesus. Help them to use their sports. Help them to use their arts, help them to use their academics, help them to use the money that they have to glorify Jesus. Because the greatest thing that we can do for the next generation is help them fall in love with Jesus. Not this world. Please, this world has nothing to offer them. Nothing. Kids today this generation is the most stressed generation that has walked this planet in modern history. Kids are taking their lives like crazy. They are stressed out. They are broken. They, they, are, they are underneath a load that should never be on them at all. Can we just let kids be kids? 
Help them fall in love with Jesus. Please. I'm telling you now, be, why? Because as they leave, they head out of your nest, it gets a whole lot more difficult to do that. Please, please help them. This generation coming up behind us needs Jesus, and we need to show them the way. All oh, that's free. I don't know. I just felt like the Spirit told me that, so I needed to tell you that. God, you know our hearts. You know each one of us. Thank you for the blessings that you pour out into our families, whether it's material or just having kids, just having a roof, having water, having a bed to sleep in. God, thanks for that. God, I know that I wish I could do things differently than I did. Well, Lord, thank you that there's nothing wasted with you. Nothing wasted. You seem to take ashes and make beauty out of it. So I trust you. I believe that you can do great things. God, you know the hearts of every one of us. You know the reality of our soul. Help us, Lord. Help us to love you. Love others. God, you're good. If there's somebody here that doesn't know you, I pray that they'd put their faith and trust in you today, here, now. Thank you for your son, Jesus, in his name I pray. Let's stand. Let's sing.